right. Welcome back everyone to um, another long awaited um, episode of Grow Your Path to Wellness. We've had some gaps in scheduling and then we decided to take a break and some different things. So, but we are back. We're back today. Our last guest, if you missed it, our last released episode was with Carolina Martin and she talked all about um, fostering wellness through creative processes with folks. So it was a really good episode and we're happy to be back. And this morning we welcome Molly Feigl and we're going to be talking on parenting teens and fostering emotional wellness um, within, within families. Um, so thank you so much, Molly, for joining us, being our first guest back after a couple months and giving us some of your Sunday morning. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Now, do I awesome. feel now, Amanda goes? Amanda. I'm so glad <laughs> Molly's here. I was telling Kelsey <laughs> before we started hitting record, like networking has got me so many places and connected to so many people. And Molly is one of those wonderful people that as soon as we started talking, I was like, you get it, right? Like when you find your people that are doing similar things that you are in the world and trying to help people live less uh, stressful, overwhelming lives and be more content and thrive. Uh, it's always a beautiful thing. So for people that don't know you, Molly, um, who are you and why is this topic such a passion for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Molly Feigl, Parenting Support. Um, people who are looking for me, sometimes they don't know how to spell my last name. It's F as in Frank, E-I-G-A-L. Or I have people tell me, just Google Molly Parenting Support and my stuff will show up. They don't really have to worry about my last name. Um, I uh, live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I taught elementary music for 20 years. So had a lot of time within the school system supporting kids, I got into it because I wanted to support young people. And um, I've also spent almost 30 years now at a, a summer camp for teenagers in the Northwoods of Minnesota. So I spend a lot of times with teens. I have two of my own teenagers, a 12 year old and a 15 year old. So those of you who have teens, we are in the same place right now, <laughs> okay? Um, and uh, in brief, I recognize that even the best parents get absolutely blindsided by the behaviors of their kids sometimes, especially as we're hitting that preteen and teenage time. Um, so many things are changing, which we're going to go into in a little bit. But what I've discovered is, especially preteen and teenage parents, or parents of that age, um, we just feel a little bit like, wait, what do I do now? And then we feel bad about ourselves because we don't know what to do. And we think we should be able to figure it out. And that's where I step in. So I, um, <laughs> there are many reasons why, and I can go into it more deeply if you like, but I truly believe we are in a mental health crisis for our preteens and teens and young adults right now. And um, parents can make a huge change. So I got certified as a parent coach. I've been doing that for two years now and helping families make change in their own households so that we can try to grow those happy, healthy humans that we're trying to <laughs> trying so hard to grow. Um, what th did I not say in that that I need to have said, Amanda? <laughs> nothing, nothing at all. That was beautiful. And I love that you do summer camp. Did you say like in the woods? Did I take that very literally? Because Quite that, literally, yes. Like I love stuff like that. So. Yeah. Well, and also Kelsey also lives in the woods. So, you know. Yeah, also kind of very literally. So. Um, okay, awesome. <laughs> There's this beautiful place if you ever come visit us in Ohio called Hocking Hills in Southern Ohio. It's beautiful. There's caves and just beautiful, beautiful. But that's another topic for another time. <laughs> right, whole, right. So I heard you say that and I'm like, ooh, I'm not, ooh. Myself, I'm not a parent. Um, but I, in my practice, I work with teens, older teens, like usually six, mm -hmm. like 15, 16 and up and then young adults. So, but I work with a ton of parents of teens of course so yeah. I'm super excited for this topic today so yeah absolutely um, absolutely thanks when you say that Molly when you say we are in a mental health crisis with our mm -hmm. teens what exactly do you mean by that hmm. um there are so many uh statistics coming out right now about the the mental health of our teens um I don't have them at my fingertips right now but things like um anxiety is up uh, depression is up. Self-harm is up. Um, 
sinking away from the world and into themselves is up. And um, as a parent of two teenagers, I see that in my own household. As a teacher, I am still, um, not only have I been a music teacher, but I teach other music teachers. And so I, I have my finger on the pulse of music teachers around the nation. And when we talk about this age range, we are all noticing patterns and things happening. Um, the summer camp that I work at <clears throat> is, uh, is <laughs> little plug, Concordia Language Villages <laughs> in northern Minnesota. Uh, it's a language immersion. And what they do in the summers is have teens, like thousands of teens are up at Concordia learning language and living in the woods. And I was able to um, train in some at the French Voyager program, train in some of the counselors this summer. And when I asked them, what are you seeing? What things have been coming to you in the past two years that I can help you address when it shows up again? And the amount of homesickness in teenagers has skyrocketed. The amount of anxiety that they're seeing has skyrocketed. The amount of not being able to know what to do when they're in a uncomfortable situation or a situation that's new and the, the youth are showing it in their behaviors. So everywhere I look, I am seeing the signals that um, our preteens and our teens are not doing well. And we could certainly talk about why if we wanted to, but there's not much we can do about the why anymore. Um, what I like to say <laughs> is that over the past couple of years, the way that that children normally develop uh, has been disrupted. Um, by a variety of things. But the way that children's bodies and brains typically normally develop, you know, they're on a certain trajectory and there's all these hormonal and chemical things happening in the preteen years. And there's all this physical growth and emotional growth and mental growth and social emotional, like social awareness growth. And in the past few years, there have been so many things that have disrupted the normal growth trajectory of our kids and it's not just the pandemic although that is although that is a huge one um, there are many other things that interrupt that which I can go into also um, and so what we're seeing now is uh, uh, the results of that and then people going well what do we do what do we do what do we do and uh, I got things to do for the parents I'm like this is okay this is what to do. <laughs> I love that so much, Molly. You're right. And one of the things that I always point out is like, even just, you know, from when we were growing up to now, the access to information, like we had to go to a library and look at an encycl encyclopedia or like a newspaper or right. Like you weren't getting the, you know, maybe like the five o'clock, six o'clock news was when you were seeing things, but now the things that we're experiencing, the traumatic things, the stress, the things that you're saying we can't really do much about are more at the forefront, right? I remember like 9-11 for us and the fact that some of the teachers had that on on the screen was like controversial at the time. Now kids have this stuff literally at their fingertips. Um, and so that I think is a major contributor to it as well. Um, I think all three of us know, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and um, building blocks and foundational things that are required to help kiddos um, is is really important, but can you help our audience understand um, what are some few, a few practical and easy to implement do's and don'ts for that like basic level connection and authenticity with teens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we find it really hard sometimes to uh, connect with our teens. Um, what 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 pulls at my heart and you know, and twists my stomach <laughs> in in my own situation is um, watching my two kids draw away from me. So we think back to when, you know, they were toddlers or elementary school and you come home and they're like, mom or dad, and they come running up and they love you and they just want to be all over you. And you're saying to yourself, oh, this is great. And leave me alone for a minute. Um, 
And then we hit this age that I don't, I, I know, Amanda, your, your kiddo is not this age yet. And uh, Kelsey, I haven't asked if you have kids or not. Okay. Um, but we hit this age where that is shifting and changing. And developmentally, it feels like, ah, ah, we know it's right, but it's also developmentally driving us a little crazy as parents. They start drawing away from us. So it's hard to connect, but here are a couple things that we can do. All right. Try to find a way to enter into their world in the places where they will allow you to. Make a little list for yourself, parents, of their strengths. What do they do well? What do they do? Um, when do you see them happy? What are some activities that they like to do? And I'm not saying, I mean, in some families, it's a very active activity you know, playing soccer or riding their bike or something. In some families, it's a very calm activity, uh, drawing, writing their own stories, watching anime, playing video games for the love of God, right? At this point, you just need to notice. So notice, use your eyes, use your ears, use your heart. Notice the things that they like to do and that makes them happy and see if there are ways that whether you like it or not, you can join in on their world. So showing an interest in their interests and asking them questions about it. Having them teach you things. Hi, could you teach me how to play this video game? And you know your character is going to die five million times, right? And they will laugh at you. And you're like, oh, I can't believe I'm playing a video game. Um, so that's one. Enter into their world and see... It, see if they'll allow you to um molly can i just say it's so silly because as you say that it's like how do how do you make friends how do kids make friends they're like oh i like pokemon you like pokemon let's share pokemon right and like literally right. what you just said is that and not that we want to only be our kids friend but right. part of right. us has to know that skill in order to connect with them and so as right. you said that it was like we've lost that because I think even some adults as Kelsey and I experience and probably you Molly like um, they come to us in therapy and they're like how do I make friends as an adult and it's the same right just connect about similar interests so I love that right right and then um you know people say well is it just about connection or you know what do I do next um because some people say I have a great connection like we do this stuff all the time and yet still you know, things are going on. What connection does in the brain, especially when it's a connection to a caring adult, is it calms the instinctual part of the brain, the amygdala, um, that's way deep, deep by the brainstem. I, when I'm doing this, I touch the back of my neck because I think of it as being deep in there. It's actually more like in the, you know, anyway, it's deep, deep in the brainstem, by the brainstem. Connecting with them as an adult to a caring adult, to a young person, it, um, it tells the instinctual part of them that's in charge of survival, oh, someone is taking care of me. I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm going to be housed and fed. Quite literally, it's telling the instinctual part, okay, it's, you're going to be okay now. So the more connections you can build to tell that instinctual part, hey, you're going to be okay now. That almost fends off the, um, Amanda, what you were saying about uh, the information coming at them that is terrifying. <laughs> so a simple thing like a connection with you, it feels really too easy, but it is this magic trick of telling their brain and body, ah, you can take a deep breath, you're going to be okay. Um, but it's not, it's not logical. It's all instinctual. So I got sidetracked a little. There was another point I was going to make, but I can't remember it. If you guys think you know what I was going to say, bring me back around to it. Um, I mean, I, I'm a nerd. So I teach my own clients a lot about like the actual, like the somatic experience of the body. And I love that you brought that up because whenever I tell my teen clients something like that, they're like, so just simply it sounds like something simple something small to do and I'm like but it has that level of an impact because I feel like our gen not even just our generation of kids and teens but I think so much loneliness I'm seeing more of Absolutely. just like 
like isolation and it's like well you know I love social media in ways you know there's great things about it but it's an algorithm like it's set up to be constant stimulation constant is there a connection aspect to it of course but it's way different and it has a an in-person safe authentic Mm -hmm. curious mindful connections do something totally different that technology you know technological connections don't do and when you you teach that and they're like huh no way and I'm like so we're starting with our days when we first even teens when they first open their eyes looking at it right doing it and then off we go and then the disconnect that that causes but just within a household it's like our parents have no no idea like anything about their their teens and like what they are interested in and it's crazy just how complex that actually is um so I don't know if I added anything Um, absolutely I I I have this I have this great analogy um (laughs) that I came up with myself thank you very much and I'm about to put out into the world wow for the first time um I have this great analogy for social media it's um it's like Pavlov's dogs when the bell rings for the dogs they uh they associated that with being fed and so they salivated right well for our brains um the social interaction is the ah, is being fed it's like ah and um what social media does and i am just as addicted to it as anyone else what social media does is it dings it rings the bell but we don't ever actually get the food but our brain goes, oh, I was seen. Oh, someone liked that or someone commented. And so the bell rings and we salivate. We go, oh, I've been socialized, but you're not actually eating anything. And I had that conversation with my own kids recently. And once it, just like, just like you, Kelsey, they were like, oh, that makes sense. So it tricks our, our brain chemistry. Right. It's like, okay. oh, you're getting that need met. And it's like, actually right. not. You're just kind of, it's just keeping it on this and chronic loop. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. So Molly, um, can I just say something about what you just said? Like, and I explained that to my own children because yeah. Pavlov, okay. Like if you don't know who Pavlov is, it's like, it's like a basic psychology study that they did um, to, to reinforce behavior um, psychology. And you the fact that you're explaining that to a 12 and a 15 year old makes me so happy and I think it feeds into what you're saying about authenticity is that I've even realized now that and this is there's no judgment or comparison it's just a noticing of differences like my kids only two and yet from as early on as I could I talk and I explain and I answer and I you know to to whatever capacity that is at his little age i try to give the information and make it make sense right and mm-hmm. i think that for so many families and kids that that's missing like parents think that kids can't maybe maybe they're frustrated the parents are frustrated they don't have time they're hurried they don't have the patience or they don't think that the kids can take information in that way or Mm -hmm. do you Mm -hmm. notice that like I think that that's maybe such a crucial piece to this connection and understanding with kids yeah one of the things I noticed as my 20 years as an elementary music teacher is that um the the, I feel like we can really trust the kids to understand that's 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 what one of my takeaways um and when I say 20 years as an elementary music specialist, um, let me let me draw your attention to how many children I have witnessed grow up in my classroom. So to give a little validity to um, my observation here, uh, 20 years, same school. The school has about 750 kids in it, and I saw every one of them. So if you think about from um, kindergarten to fifth grade uh, for over 20 years, I saw a lot of children. So what I noticed is that when we kind of baby down the lesson or the language, uh, it is not helpful. Now, when there are things in the world that are um, big and scary, of course, we pick an appropriate way to communicate that with kids. And 
I have I have a whole course practically on that <laughs> that people can access if they'd like to reach out to me. Um, uh, but the bigger things like um, how your brain works and how your emotions work and um, social interactions and things like that, they're eager to suck up that knowledge and they're um, interested and they notice, they're curious. And so um, not sharing some of that information with them from early on, I think, is a huge disservice. I really, I really do think that if we taught children more about how the brain body chemistry stuff all works, it would give them a basis for understanding for when they're going through their own changes. Did you know that around seven or eight years old, there is a hormonal shift in most um, people who are assigned female at birth. There is a hormonal shift. People come to me and say, why is my seven or eight year old girl insane now? Why is she crazy? Because there's been a chemical shift at about that time that a lot of parents don't know about because who teaches that, right? Um, so having everybody know about these things, I think would be really, really helpful. And especially just having the conversation with your kids. Here's a point I want, I would like to make if I could, um, you asked for some practical tips for connecting. So here's another practical tip that, um, can be used in having conversations about, you know, brain chemistry stuff with your kids or just in general, choose your reaction to their behaviors. Um, recognizing that, and I have a whole a whole series of, of of coursework and information and coaching on this topic as well. Recognize that behaviors that are coming at you or behaviors you're seeing are based on their their brain chemistry and based on the stressors in their lives at the moment, and they're not actually trying to make you angry or trying to cause you trouble. Um, that's another thing I learned as a teacher and as a parent is that there's something else going on within them. So when you have, you see this reaction, you see this behavior from a child, you have to, as the adult, take a moment and go, okay, this behavior is not really about me. And yet I'm having this intense reaction within myself. It's, it's all about mindfulness. Like, recognize what's happening in your own body. Once you recognize that, then you get to choose your own reaction. Are you going to um, escalate the energy rising up with the child? And um, is it is it going to be an angry escalation? Is it going to be a, a joyful escalation? Sometimes people escalate in happiness. And with, that's great if, if that's the right pathway. Or are you going to choose a pathway that is a little bit more connective and calming to help bring that child back, telling that instinctual part of the brain, okay, calm down, um, so that the prefrontal cortex, the logical part, can come back on? I don't think I talked about that yet. Okay, teaching moment. Can I do this teaching moment? Yeah, I was going to say that, like, what you're saying is that those the behaviors are not many people don't realize the behavior is not conscious. It is not right. a conscious right. decision. And oftentimes I hear they're manipulating me. They did that on purpose. They're taking they advantage. Yeah. They're trying um, to get attention. Yep. I'm like, and, you're not wrong though. <laughs> and, and also we don't even realize <laughs> right. in ourselves as adults that when that, we don't even have the connection enough in our own bodies to know, oh my gosh, I feel it in my chest. I'm getting hot. Oh, and then we just explode, right? We're, we're not consciously often making those behaviors either, unless we've been taught how to mindfully um, be aware. So yes, Molly, quick, right. quick little yeah. science yep. lesson as we're wrapping up here. Yep. Quick. Oh yeah. Tell me what's our time. Oh, that much time. Okay, great. Um, Quick little science lesson. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, that's the front part of the brain. It's in charge of uh, logic and attuned communication, like actually tuned in with people. Um, and, you know, uh, what happens if I do this and planning and all that stuff, logical thought. That and the amygdala are never on at the same time. 
All right, that's a little overstated, but for parents, just know that. When there's a stress response that is coming from the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex turns off and the logic is not there. The biggest mistake I made in my music classroom was trying to logic with kids who are in the middle of a meltdown. They don't need that. They need that connection we talked about. A deep breath. I'm here with you. You you feel really upset. It's okay to feel upset. And once they come down off of that, the logic turns back on again. And then you can talk about what happened and start making plans and talk about rules and all that stuff. Um, can I plug my website and my um, my download right now before we get too close to the end? Yeah, cool. yeah. I was. If there's anything else um, that you wanted to share about as far as topic wise at the end, yeah, we always give you opportunity to share all that, and it'll be in the show notes too. So, okay, cool. Um, on my website, I have a free download called Seven Tips to Seven Ways to Connect with Your Teens, and we've touched on a couple of them in this conversation. But my website is www dot molly m-o-l-l-y feigl f as in frank e-i-g-a-l uh, molly feigl parenting support so parenting and support i'm going to have you spell that yourself dot com and uh my free download there's a there's a you'll see a blue button that says free download click on that and you can you can get to my um handout my handout my my download seven ways to connect with your teens and what's great about this list is it came from the teenagers it yeah right kelsey's like oh yeah. it came it's like you're such a therapist because i'm like oh i feel so cheesy right now but i love that you did that <laughs> it came from the work of um my friend anna scoby and myself um working with teenagers and asking them what do you want your parents to know to to parent you better and so they came up with these do's and don'ts Mm -hmm. and then we flipped them so that you could understand them better as parents and that is part of the handout so oh i also if any of you are seeing this and live in the minnesota area november 5th sunday november 5th i have an in-person retreat just north of the twin cities and you can also find that on my website and it's uh yeah right kelsey's like interesting it's a parent retreat come up and hang out and <laughs> i am not a parent but i will come and i will <laughs> share hey, my life or something exactly exactly so i i can still talk about things but i just wanted to get my um my free download in because if people are listening to this because they really wanted information on their teens yeah that download is rich with information. Yeah. And I, um, you know, Molly and I are really great accountability buddies in our businesses. So I helped, I helped proof that document and it is chef's kiss. Very good. <laughs> Highly recommend. So we'll make sure that we have your link in the um, show notes so people can go right to your website. We also will have your Facebook and Instagram links on there and your LinkedIn and right. all the good stuff. Right. Um, Molly, we always ask everyone before we close out, what is like parting words or a mantra or a quote, something that you can leave our audience with today that'll help them feel better yeah. about their relationship with their kiddos? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't think through a great closing, so let me just pour one, pour one out of my heart. Um, hey, parents, you are not alone. This is harder than we all thought. And parenting right now in this post-pandemic world is um, insane. <laughs> However, you are the change maker in your child's life. You are the, um, you can make positive change in their body chemistry, in their brain pathways, in their hearts, and how they move forth into the world. So please um, know that you're not alone. And uh, feel free to reach out. Um, my email ad- address, if you just want to email me, is molly at coachmollyf, as in Frank, dot com. So um, we're all in this together. You're not alone. Take a deep breath and just settle into the present moment and connect with your teenagers. You're so right. No one prepared us for any of this, right? <laughs> They taught us how to do like 40 to 7,000 types of math and we, no one prepared us on how to care for our own bodies or how to care for little people's bodies. So you're not alone. (laughs) Really quickly too. Go for it, Kelsey. Yep. I love that you are offering support, you know, on the parents side, like very specific content because 
one of the biggest things I see like in my practice is parents who were like I was never like like we've already said like I was never taught this and it's not just like it's not a just a topic like this is something that is very vulnerable so like this isn't like your it's kind of like my mantra that I tell my clients is like it's really vulnerable work and like having kids really does they're like I don't have my own but it's like I've heard it's such a beautiful like complex experience that will bring out your own stuff basically absolutely absolutely so it's a very vulnerable place to be as a parent um so in parenting in today's age so I want to like reinforce that for people that when I reinforce that in my sessions they're like okay yeah so this isn't just something yeah. you can go and read in a self-help book and like get everything you need and I'm like no no, no you need you need you need a team you need a support really team and if we lived yeah. in Pleasantville, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, like, yeah. That might be great. Yeah. Yeah. People sometimes also get confused about what I do. So, real quickly, I do private coaching, four sessions, and you're pretty much done. I do group coaching if you've got a group of people or want to be part of a community of parents who come together. Um, and I do it all virtually. It's all virtual. Um, I am putting together in my neighborhood some in-person coffee shop group conversations and I do retreats and I do trainings for staff people anywhere <laughs> I don't just yeah, have like, a conversation all, with lovely like people you do all kinds of things but I was like regardless I of I feel you like kind of that togetherness and it's like yeah, not alone. And the first thing that came to my mind was how vulnerable this type of work and learning is. So absolutely, thank you. absolutely. You're welcome. Thank it you has so been much. So Molly. cool to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, everyone, make sure that you follow, like, subscribe, leave us comments. We want to hear your feedback. Did you like the episode? What would you like to see more of? Um, and ring the bell so that you get notified when new episodes come out. Like I said, we will have all of Molly's contact information in the show notes for you. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye.